the Department of Film and Media here at UC Berkeley. She's the author of two books, First Picturing American Modernity, Traffic, Technology, and Silent American Cinema, as well as the more recent Spectacular Digital Effects, CGI, and Contemporary Cinema. And she's currently writing a book on 3D from the stereoscope to digital 3D, which I believe her talk today is related to. And the title today is Clarity, Obscurity, and Parallax Effects, the nonfiction 3D image from the stereoscope to digital 3D document. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> yeah, there are a couple seats in the middle, this always. <clears throat> when discussing the effects of Werner Herzog's decision to film the show They Cave in 3D, scholars and critics settle on the explanation that 3D functions in Cave of Forgotten Dreams chiefly to give relief to the undulating surfaces of the cave walls that the Paleolithic painters exploited in order to create the illusion of motion, dimensiona dimensionality, and directionality in their figural depictions of animals. While this is certainly the case, such observations gloss over the effects of digital 3D's precarious aesthetic, its tendency to undermine conventional optical cues, the imminent disorder created by the planar quality of its image, its distortion of distance, scale, and perspective, and its occasional ghosting, strobing, and pixelated noise, what Anthony Lane referred to as that gray fuzz which still afflicts 3D, end quote. In what follows, I'll argue that rather than simply bring surfaces of the cave into greater relief, Herzog's use of 3D's precarious aesthetic is central to the film's communication of the cave's historical uncanniness the disquieting unease that arises from the eruption of the unthinkably distant past in the present in the form of the cave's long-hidden and perfectly preserved 32,000-year-old paintings, bringing to, abruptly bring, brought to light by the cave's discoverers and the scientists who study it. In this film, Herzog uses 3D's precarious aesthetics to remediate the cave's vivid images as, quote, memories of long-forgotten dreams, end quote, that have their origins in those old surmounted beliefs whose return, Freud argued, is so central to the experience of the uncanny. With its emphasis on the secret and hidden brought to, the secret and hidden brought to light, the uncanny is inseparable from questions of visibility and knowability and the limits of each. And here, the English definition of uncanny as beyond can or beyond knowledge is important. In the process of using stereoscopic relief to bring to life the cave's historically uncanny images and spaces, Herzog exploits the links between positive parallax and what, be, what might be called epistemic seeing, the desire to see and know something hidden and concealed. At the same time, positive parallax establishes the limits of, of the knowable, and as such, it is easily harnessed to the production of the intellectual uncertainty at the core of the uncanny. In turn, Herzog aligns negative parallax, or 3D emergence effects, to affective seeing, whereby emergent images endowed with illusory solidity and tangibility efface differences between vision and touch, in the process enchanting the senses and conjuring up the fleeting illusion that one might reach across what Herzog calls the abyss of time and forge a tangible connection to the unthinkably distant past that haunts the present within the confines of the cave. With this in mind, we can say that 3D is particularly well suited to give expression to the disquieting boundary violations at stake in the historical uncanny, precisely because its formal features and aesthetics are defined in part by their effacement of the screen as threshold and barrier. A return to Freud is helpful here. Working from Schelling's assertion that, quote, Unheimlich is the name for everything that ought to have remained secret and hidden but comes to light, end quote, Freud defined the canny as, quote, something which is familiar and old established in the mind and which has become alienated from it only through processes of repression, end quote. These include, of course, surmounted ideas such as the belief in animism, magic, or the omnipotence of thoughts, and the fantasy of interuterine existence, particularly as figured to the fear of being buried alive. Uncanny affect can arise from the experience of doppelgangers, a sense of fatalism governing inexplicable repetition or unintentional return to the same place, and intellectual doubt generated by confusion over whether something is living or dead, present or absent, themes and experiences that are in play throughout Cave. More important to 3D's precarious aesthetics, however, is the uncanny's categorical ambivalence. Tracing the etymology of Heimlich and Unheimlich 
Freud explains that the meaning of Heimlich tended to, quote, develop in the direction of ambivalence until it finally coincides with, the, with its opposite, unheimlich, end quote, thanks to a secondary set of meanings linking Heimlich to that which is, quote, secret and concealed, kept from sight so that others do not get to know of or about it, end quote. Ultimately, Freud explains, unheimlich is in some way or other a subspecies of Heimlich. This ambivalence has been central to the work of scholars as, such as Laura Mulvey and Tom Gunning, who have analyzed the ability of old and new media to produce uncanny effects through their effacement of categorical boundaries. The fi this final point is key, for 3D is so productively harnessed to the articulation of the historical uncanny, precisely because they efface boundaries separating sight from touch, distance and proximity, the immaterial and material, diegetic space and the space of exhibition, and the knowable and unknowable. A brief turn to 19th and 20th century discourses on stereographics, 3D images is helpful here, but they offer insight into how Herzog exploits the e-reality affected by 3D's hallucinatory clarity on one hand and its, its aesthetic precarity on the other in order to communicate the cave's uncanny historicity or what Herzog refers to as its blurring of time. In his writings on the stereoscope and the stereograph in the Atlantic Monthly, Oliver Wendell Holmes explained to readers that the stereoscope manufactures, quote, a surprise such as no painting ever produced. The mind feels its way into the very depths of the picture. The scraggy branches of a tree in the foreground run out at us as if they, as if they would scratch our eyes out. The elbow of a figure stands forth so as to make us almost uncomfortable, end quote. Here, Holmes links negative parallax to the conflation of sight and touch and positive parallax with epistemic seeing, such, as, such that, quote, the mind feels its way into the picture, end quote, through a haptic look that sees in order to know. Both effects derive from the illusory solidity and tangibility that the stereoscope gives to depicted objects. Hence, in what is now a well-known formulation, Holmes describes the stereoscope as, quote, an instrument which makes surfaces look solid. All pictures in which perspective and light and shade are properly managed have more or less the effect of solidity. But by this instrument, that effect is so heightened as to produce an appearance of reality, which cheats the senses with its seeming truth, end quote. So persuasive was this illusory solidity that when describing the perceptual experience of a stereograph of the full moon, Holmes claimed, quote, the sphere rounds itself out so perfectly to the eye that it seems as if we could grasp it like an orange, end quote. Aided by a wealth of photographic detail, the illusory solidity of stereoscopic images demonstrates Freud's observation that, quote, an uncanny effect is often and easily produced when the distinction between imagination and reality is effaced as when something we have hitherto regarded as imaginary appears before us in reality, or when a symbol takes over the full functions of the thing it symbolizes, and so on." End quote. To be sure, the uncanny pleasures of the stereoscope grew out of, out of the knowledge about the fabricated nature of such illusions and, for Holmes, the means by which they were accomplished. Significantly, 3D holds the vivid clarity and illusory solidity and presence it gives to the objects and scenes it depicts in a dialectical relationship with a precarious aesthetic defined by what Jonathan Crary calls stereoscopy's derangement of the conventional functioning of optical cues. The same stereoscopic relief that charges foregrounded objects with hallucinatory clarity is also, and often within the same image, responsible for creating what Crary calls the, quote, imminent disorder, end quote, of the 3D image. As Crary explains, in the stereoscopic image, certain planes or surfaces, even though composed of indications of light or shade that normally designate volume, are perceived as flat. Other planes that normally would be read as two-dimensional, such as a fence in the floor, foreground, seem to occupy space aggressively. Thus, stereoscopic relief or depth has no unifying logic or order. If perspective implied a homogeneous and potentially metric space, the stereoscope discloses a fundamentally disunified and aggregate field of disjunct elements." End quote. The imminent disorder of stereoscopic of the stereoscopic 3D image and its, quote, derangement of the conventional functioning of optical cues, end quote, accounts, I think, for Andre Bazin's description of the illusory tangibility of the 3D image, which turns Holmes' description of the same on its head. 
Rather than create a compelling sense of solidity, for Bazin, the 3D image instead, quote, gives an effective impression that the objects are in space, but in the form of intangible phantoms, creating, quote, an impression of irreality that is even more perceptible than that of flat cinema in black and white, end quote. Herzog exploits this tension between the 3D image's hallucinatory clarity and solidity on one hand and its aesthetic precarity on the other in a sequence that begins with a trip through a 3D map of the cave and ends with an image of the scientists that use it standing inside the cave. The first scene takes us through millions of points of light that plot out and account for every millimeter of the cave's surface. The map, we are told, is, quote, the basis for all the scientific projects being done here, end quote. The virtual camera's fly-through emphasizes the immersive effects of positive parallax as the camera moves along the z-axis into the depths of the cave's hidden recesses, laying bare its geological structure and spatial orientation with a clarity that is radically absent in the rest of the film. However, as we move through space, Herzog's voiceover suggests that, quote, the painters of the cave seem to speak to us from a familiar yet distant universe, end quote, thereby emphasizing the otherworldliness of the cave and transforming the star-like floating immateri immateriality of the visualized data into an emblem for a distant past that is imminent within the cave yet ephemeral, ephemeral and unknowable. Schelling's use of the metaphor bringing to light the hidden and secret in his definition of the uncanny is germane here. As the map's points of light suggest, it is the outcome of the efforts of the archaeologists to illuminate the contents of the cave using the scientific methods of the Enlightenment, an approach that contrasts sharply with Herzog's own efforts to illuminate the cave in a way that reproduces the effects that firelight would have had on the painted figures thousands of years ago, its flickering variability casting haunting shadows that would have created the illusion of motion. In Herzog's hands, 3D's precarious aesthetic suggests that in the end, the various methods used to bring the contents of the cave to light only confirm that much of the, much of the past glimpsed in the cave resists rationalization and demonstrates how, in refusing to disclose itself, the past gains affective power by haunting the present. This idea is very clearly expressed in an interview that immediately follows the camera's flight through the digital reconstruction of the cave, in which the circus performer turned archaeologist, Julian Money, explains to Herzog that, quote, the first time I entered the Chauvet cave, I had a chance to get in during five days, and it was so powerful. Then, every night, I was dreaming of lions, and every day was the same shock for me. It was an emotional shock. I mean, I'm a scientist, but a human too, and after five days, I decided not to go back into the cave because I needed time just to relax and take time to absorb it, end quote. This emotional shock evidences the cave's haunting affective power as its painted prehistoric lions leave the lockdown space of the cave and invade his dreams, cavorting through his unconscious with real lions. It's precisely that such shock that 3D provokes through its precarious aesthetics. Indeed, Herzog suggests that nothing less than shock is required to communicate the cave's uncanny historicity, for as the data visualization sequence indicates, the, caves, the cave re-emerged in a thoroughly mapped world already saturated by all pervasive information. 3D's derealization of space is necessary to the cave's re-enchantment and to Herzog's efforts to wrest the cave from its status as a site from which data is to be harvested, quantified, and analyzed. Herzog's exploitation of the planar quality of the 3D image is important in this respect. Now, this is going to be an instance where showing you this image in 2D completely fails um, to sort of represent the, the aesthetic here. Um, this is such a, an unremarkable, boring shot um, in 2D, but it's actually extraordinary, I think, in 3D. Uh, following the interview, we cut to a shot of money and another scientist, Val Valerie Ferulio, positioned along the two-foot two metal walkway that runs the length of the cave and lit against its darkened background. Along with the equipment behind her, Ferulio's proximity to the camera results in the creation of a gray halo around her body and flattens her image like a cardboard cutout. So she really seems to sort of 
not really be in that space. Um, and then money sort of stands in the midfield, and he's similarly lit and flattens. Um, and then you have that uh, little piece of technology in the back, which also um, is sort of quite flattened. The composition and lighting of the shot exaggerate the planar quality of the 3D image, distorting the distance between the two scientists, as well as their relative scale in relation to one another and the other elements in the frame. The ghosting of the image, the derangement of optical cues, and the annihilation of linear perspective not only emphasize the cave's unnerving otherworldliness, but also give the archaeologists a ghostly, alienated presence in the cave, such that they take on the look of spectral figures that invade and haunt the distant past from the present, much as the cave lions invade and haunt money's dreams. This idea of the present invading the past is reiterated later when we see the crew walking through the same darkened chambers previously laid out with such clarity by the 3D map. As Herzog explains, quote, dwarfed by these large chambers, illuminated by our wandering lights, sometimes we were overcome by a strange, irrational sensation as if we were disturbing the Paleolithic people in their work. It felt like eyes upon us. This sensation occurred to some of the scientists and also the discoverers of the cave. It was a relief to surface again, above ground, end quote. The derealization created by 3D's precarious aesthetics is central to Herzog's project of evoking and provoking the shock created by an encounter with the cave's uncanny historicity, or what Herzog calls its blurring of time. This kind of formal composition uh, that exaggerates the planar quality of the image is used and recurs throughout the film. So in, in this image, um, the sort of the foregrounded scientist, or this is a member of the crew, really kind of bulges out. Um, and the one in the corner, and, and again, the image is intentionally ex um, composed in order to sort of play on this um, derangement of optical cues, seems really, really far away, stretched off in the distance. But again, he's illuminated in a way that then makes him seem sort of like a cardboard cutout. Um, so this kind of formal composition that exaggerates the planar quality of the image is used throughout the film and is quite prominent in the shot of the cave's original opening that appears at the beginning of the film. In this shot, Herzog can be seen at the end of a narrow passage through which the scientists and crew must crawl in order to reach the cave's first large chamber. Again, positive parallax stretches the image, placing Herzog at a further remove than he actually is in space and distorts the layers of calcite formations into a series of flattened planes that recede into depth. Here, the tendency of the 3D image to produce a, quote, vertiginous uncertainty about the distance separating forms, end quote, corresponds to the vertiginous uncertainty about the best historical distance, or what Herzog refers to as an abyss of time, that separates both the recent past depicted in the film and the present moment of its reception, when the spectator's interocular disparity conjures up the 3D image, and those staggered moments in the very distant past when the cave paintings and the calcite formations were created. While negative parallax charges foregrounded elements with a phantom solidity that promises a tangible connection to the distant past, and sort of then sort of does not make good on that promise, the flat and uh, planar quality given to the background elements creates areas of occlusion behind each, suggesting that the knowledge produced as the mind feels its way into the depths of the cave is only partial, that each artifact, each geological formation conceals as much as it reveals. Hence, although the finite space of the cave has been thoroughly mapped, with the help of 3D's precarious aesthetic, it seems to recede infinitely into the irretrievable past. This notion is most strongly suggested by the figure of the Chauvet Venus painted on a pendant that hangs from the ceiling in the farthest reaches of the cave. In the first half of the film, the, paint, the sort of full um, image of the painting remains beyond the scope of the camera's lens. The walkway to which the scientists and crew must restrict, uh, to, which, to which the scientists and crew much, must restrict their movements falls well short of the pendant, ensuring that much of the Venus, as well as the rest of the pendant, will for a time remain obscured. Later, when Herzog and his crew return to shoot the cave by themselves, they attach the camera to a long stick to bring more of the image into view, thereby revealing a bison that embraces the lower body of the, um, the, lower body of the woman. Though comparatively more complete, the image remains enigmatic, 
and seems to demand analysis by several archaeologists whose long interpretations ultimately place the image at the limits of the knowable. Familiar as the image may be, and some of them sort of tell us it bears an iconic similarity to the Venus of Holofels um, and is compared to Picasso's painting of the Minotaur and the Woman, um, it's nevertheless a token of animism, and as such, it simply returns us to the uncanny. Indeed, after describing the animistic beliefs and the radically different way of inhabiting the world that the painting evidences, Jean Claude argues that the designation given to modern humanity, Homo sapiens, or the man who knows, is incorrect because, he explains, we know nothing, we do not know. Hence, Herzog stages our encounter with the slightly less obscured image of the woman and the bison as an encounter with, quote, something familiar and old established in the mind and which has become alienated from it, end quote. Even as 3D endows the pendant with sculptural solidity, its tendency to distort optical cues also charges the pendant, which seems to float in space, with the impression of irreality that Bazin associated with the format. With this tension between the hallucinatory clarity and, and its aesthetic precarity in mind, I will conclude by suggesting that if, as Anthony Vidler argues, the, quote, uncanny finds its natural place in stories centered on the idea of history suspended, the dream come to life, and the past restored in the present, end quote, it is most at home in the precarious aesthetics of stereoscopic 3D. Thank you. of From IBM to MGM, Cinema at the Dawn of the Digital Age. He's editor of Technology and Culture, the Film Reader, as well as a co-editor of the four-volume anthology Film Theory, Critical Concepts in Media and Cultural Studies. Today, he's delivering a paper titled Goodbye to Cinema, Jean-Luc Godard's Goodbye to Language as Images at the End of History. Good morning. How do you do? Uh, my paper today considers how Godard's film pictured here, engages the precariousness of cinema. Following Kristen's study of stereoscopic optics and ahead of Jordan's consideration of fuzzy objects, my own case study in precarious aesthetics examines a film that might be thought of as perhaps stereoscopically fuzzy or fuzzily stereoscopic. In pointing as it does to the very limits of cinematic language while suggesting two the conditions of its rearticulation. Released last year, Adieu au Langage is the veteran director's first feature in 3D. In utilizing 3D, Godard engages a reflexive history of perspectival dynamics and spatialized perception in a film that foregrounds and crucially in turn deconstructs the technologies of, of cinematic representation. This paper positions Adieu au Langage as a meditation on these changing technologies and aesthetics, wherein the very language of cinema, the langage of the film's title, is reimagined at the very moment of its perceived farewell, the adieu of the film's title. But why precarious? In the next 20 minutes or so, I'd like to consider three applications of the term necessarily interconnected First, a precarious historiography. As noted, this is a film that says adieu to cinema itself. Consistent with Godard's long-standing proclamations of nothing less than the very death of cinema, it engages an existential historiography. Addressing the precarious nature and status of cinema, positioned somewhere between existential demise on the one hand and the very possibility of technological aesthetic, or linguistic reinvention on the other. In doing so, Godard eschews the spectacle, scale, and technologies of existing approaches to 3D in favor of a precarious technology, 
His 3D is achieved by way of a combination of consumer, prosumer, and only occasionally professional cameras, all of which are reoriented, undermined, and pushed toward unanticipated, improper, or, in the parlance of this particular gathering, precarious practices. In this precarious mediation, a series of indistinct images, to reference Wittgenstein and this conference's original call for papers, constitute one manifestation of the power of precarious aesthetics. To return to our precarious historiography, or perhaps the long adieu, and I couldn't resist layering the text here in tribute to Godard and the film, even if it renders it all but illegible. Godard is no stranger to the idea that cinema is precariously poised in the face of one or more potential deaths, a notion he has voiced consistently throughout his career of more than half a century. As such, there is a remarkable continuity between the ending of Weekend from 1967 in its closing title, Fan de Cinema, End of Cinema, a playfully provocative, but also prophetically prescient pun on the more typical fan, i.e. end, that closes many French language films. And, nearly 50 years later, the very beginning of Adieu au Langage, which opens by saying goodbye, adieu, a salutation or benediction, most typically of departure, and various translated in the film's English language distribution as goodbye or farewell. And as, a, as an aside, it's worth reminding ourselves, as uh, Kristen did, that what we are seeing here is an image from the 2D version of the film. By contrast, in the 3D original, this text would be stereoscopically rendered, the words in red very noticeably on a different plane to those in white. And this will be the case for all of the images in this presentation, including the following short clip, which illustrates the dialectical tension or precariousness of this opening as farewell, of a cinema that arrives by announcing its very limits, obsolescence, departure. is a short clip. <laughs> in these 30 or so seconds, the word adieu appears no fewer than four times, however. We might ask, to what are we saying adieu? And is this the type of adieu that Jacques Derrida describes in The Gift of Death? Quote, the moment of separation, of departure, sometimes forever, which can never in fact be excluded, without any return on this earth at the moment of death." End quote. Later in the film, adieu is transformed into a dieu. In this playful invocation of the word god or gods, manifest here by the representational possibilities of 3D, and again this would look differently if we were seeing it in 3D, lies a linguistic philosophical pun that raises the existential ante or philosophical stakes of our adieu, linking the technological, the realm of 3D, with the eschatological, the question of the finality of death, at least in this context, with regard to Godard's recurring concern with the death, or death's plural, of cinema. Adieu has particular meaning for Emmanuel Levinas, a figure implicitly referenced within the film, as shown here, and perhaps difficult to see, but uh, at one point a book is picked up and you see that it is a Levinas text. For Levinas, as Derrida reminds us in his Adieu to Emmanuel Levinas, to say adieu derived from the word God is also to suggest an existence or presence of sorts in and beyond death. 
the greeting of the adieu does not signal the end, Derrida says. And, quoting Levinas directly, he continues thus, the adieu is not a finality. More prosaically, perhaps, Derrida has also noted how in certain contexts and regions, including, no coincidence, the French-speaking part of Switzerland in which Godard now lives, and where Adieu au langage was filmed, Adieu can also be used as a greeting, something akin to hello. In the realm of cinema, as this image from the film suggests, to say adieu is to conjure the historical memory of the medium. But also, as this second image reminds us, again, this would be rendered in 3D, to raise the possibility of a reimagining or rerouting of this historical memory, negotiating the finality referred to by Levinas. For Godard, 3D becomes a means of engaging the history of a medium at the moment of its perceived passing. We have uh, a whole number of images uh, from the history of cinema, uh, gravestones of sorts littering this film. But this is also a history reframed, literally here in these images, through a mise-en-scene that constructs a dynamic between foreground and background, perspectival relations that are emphasized when seen in 3D in a way that they are not in 2D. But a history that is also reframed symbolically in terms of the ways in which 3D exists in relation to the language and technologies that preceded it. To articulate this precarious historiography necessitates a precarious technology, an engagement with those technologies whose very existence suggests the possible demise of, of one linguistic mode in the very utterance of another. Godard's 3D is thus a negotiation of what Willem Flusser described as the universe of technical images, referring to the automaticity of pre-programmed aesthetics in imaging devices that determine the linguistic aesthetic mediation of an apparatus in the creation of these so-called technical images. Countering such automaticity in filming adieu au langage Godard eschewed the so-called professional technology of an industrial mode of 3D filmmaking, adopting instead a combination of low-tech digital imaging devices, which we see here uh, in a production still. The result is a comparative, reflexive positioning of their respective technical images in Flusser's terms, but which are also pushed to extremes that undermine their respective techniques. The closing credits of the film, transcribed here, even list the various manufacturers, devices, frame rates, etc., mapping the precise sources of the heterogeneous mixture of devices and formats whose images the spectator will have just experienced. There are obvious links to Flasseur and his critique of apparatuses that shape the nature of an image, even while effacing this very process. Flusser poses this question, one that sounds remarkably like an appeal for the precarious. Is it possible to reorganize the image's fascistic totalitarian circuitry, to turn an automatic apparatus against its own conditions of being automatic. Though writing in 1985, Flusser might just as well have been referring to the GoPro and other devices that Godard here seeks to turn against their own automaticity, or their conditions of being automatic, as Flusser puts it. Raymond Beller once wrote of Godard, that his task was, quote, to keep his eye on the eye of the cyclone and stay both on and under communication. 
While this notion is metaphorical, of course, in the shot seen here, Dada achieves this feat literally, too, showing us the shadow of a crane in the act of producing an image originally rendered in 3D. We gaze at the technology of cinema itself, in this instance doubly fascinating or doubly reflexive in terms of the way in which the shadow of the cinematic apparatus becomes a source of perspectival depth in an image whose very 3D-ness is already its principal focus. Precarious technology for Goddard is thus reflexive, custom, imperfect, and so <coughs> on. Or, as he himself puts it, if I hear high fidelity, I wonder what low fidelity is. For the film's cinematographer, likewise, the very risk of the digital image is its seeming perfection. As we are not made with ones and zeros, he argues, we need the imperfect. How can you fall in love with a digitally perfect person? To err is human. Maybe it's like preferring my old pair of shoes to the new ones. Voila. In this context, it is tempting to imagine that, however unawares, he is addressing a question first posed by Fuseur in Towards a Philosophy of Photography more than 20 years earlier. Is a photograph a consumer item like a shoe? It is through the processes of precarious mediation, the deliberate scuffing of brand new cinematic shoes, that adieu au langage constructs its images as something other than the shoe as consumer item for the cinematographer, or as technical images for Flusseur. In doing so, Godard moves toward a realization of Alexandra Struck's model of la camera stylo, the camera pen, the camera as an artistic tool and technology capable of cinematic writing as linguistic reinvention. If Godard provides us with some high definition images, precise, perfect, distinct, and rather beautiful, they provide a counterpoint to those images that come to overpower them, be they imprecise, imperfect, indistinct, or fuzzy in Jordan's terms, or rooted in obscurity rather than clarity in Kristen's terms. Adieu au langage embraces the very limits of technology, the inherent flaws of its imaging devices, embracing the realm of noise rather than signal, and of the imaging that arises out of underexposure, overexposure, and countless other variations. Its precarious aesthetic resides in this rewiring or reprogramming <clears throat> or reorienting of the familiar or culturally or technologically determined applications of its imaging devices, their hardware and software. In seeking instead, instead a precarious aesthetic, we witness images that are blurry, noisy, subject to deliberate or inadvertent glitches and other disturbances. We witness images that are saturated well beyond the industrially standardized field of color balance, or of the type of technical image that automatic settings and controls would produce, which are overridden here in order to construct color is itself a means of providing depth in a three-dimensional image, witnessed here in 2D. <clears throat> Images that are shot through both glass and water, providing a double refraction, abstraction, distanciation, as well as again providing a layering of depth that itself becomes the object of our gaze when that gaze is indeed a 3D gaze. Images that explore depth by way of the inherent imperfection of the photographic lens and the processing of the image in terms of the flare that arises from the diffusion of light 
that occurs when its source is filmed directly. And here, uh, a, a resonance with Amy's talk from yesterday. <coughs> and images of Godard's own dog, Roxy, here rendered by a series of glitches, again introducing inherent imperfections as a source of interest, not least when rendered in 3D. as we give Roxy her moment of glory in these stills. In all of these instances, if the digital glitch and related conceptions of noise, etc., are far from new in themselves, what is perhaps new are their reframing here within the context of 3D cinema, a contemporary landscape of digital imaging devices, and our very particular moment in film history, or end of history, if we engage uh, the discourses of death that Godard is so prone to provoke us with. Writing in 1948, Astruc wrote of a search for a new language of cinema by way of a camera, metaphorical as much as literal, as light and nimble as a pen, which would allow the filmmaker to write in the same way, for example, that a writer uses pen and paper. The cinema of today is capable of expressing any kind of reality, he wrote. What interests us is the creation of this new language. In the dynamic between the creation of a new language for a struc and the adieu au langage, goodbye to language of Godard, we arrive at a tentative <coughs> and thus precarious conclusion. Nearly 60 years after Estruc wrote of the cinema of today, Adieu au langage might be thought of as, in some respects, our cinema of today, an attempt to navigate the historical context of a medium poised between mm -hmm. death and the possibility of reinvention in terms of precarious history and precarious historiography between technologies prone to the production of Flusser's technical images and their opposite in terms of precarious technology. And a 3D visualization of these processes in a reflexive engagement with the historical memory of cinema in terms of precarious mediation. At the edge of cinema history, Godard says goodbye to cinema to in turn embrace the potential that comes from this precariousness. In engaging the low-tech and low-definition via typically high-tech and high-definition milieu, Godard refigures the technology and aesthetics of 3D cinema to in turn reframe the broader history and language of cinema as a medium, per the langage of the title, as seen here in another still. Most powerfully, as a, sim as a reflection on the nature and status of cinema, Godard's adieu is not simply a goodbye, but an adieu in the Levinasian sense, suggesting the continued existence of cinema in the very potential for ocular revisioning and linguistic rearticulation, rooted, at least in part, in the imaging potential of a reconfigured technological apparatus. Put simply, in this case study of precarious aesthetics, it is only in our farewell to cinema that we might envisage its continued vitality. And on this note, I shall bid you adieu. <laughs> Thank you. Jordan Schoenig, 
a fourth year PhD student in cinema and media studies at the University of Chicago. His interests include intersections between philosophical aesthetics and film theory, phenomenological approaches to film studies, and genealogies of modernism in film and other arts. He's currently writing a dissertation about philosophies of motion and film theory, and his talk today is Const Fuzzy Objects Rethinking Contingency from Early Cinema to CGI. Thank you. It's one of the most persistent anecdotes of film history that the audiences of the first exhibited films were awestruck by what Daivan has called the incidentals of scenes, such as smoke from a forge, steam from a locomotive, or brick dust from a demolished wall. Most famously during exhibitions of the Lumiere actuality, The Baby's Breakfast, I insist it's breakfast and not lunch, audiences were reportedly more interested uh, in the distant tree leaves blowing in the wind than the baby eating breakfast in the foreground. Most theorists invoke the term contingency to explain the phenomenon as an attraction to the camera's indiscriminate recording of physical reality. For Marianne Doan, the novelty of unplanned happenings on screen coincides with a uniquely modern paradigm in which chance, ephemerality, and spontaneity are newly privileged modes of experiencing the world. For Daivan, the attraction to contingency is less a historical symptom than a groundbreaking novelty in the history of visual representation. He explains that because the first film audiences would have been familiar only with the painted backdrops of the theater, they were astonished not by the moving figures in the foreground, but by the seemingly uncaused, unplanned movement of the previously inanimate background. In both cases, the wind in the trees reveals the cinema's ability to show the autonomy of the world unfold independently of authorial control. Despite the usefulness of these interpretations, the label cinematic contingency constricts what it is we're after in piecing together the attraction to the wind in the trees, the ripples of waves, and the brick dust from a demolished wall. I want to get to the good part. Um, so in this film we're watching now, I want to ask, how exactly is the dust that rises from the demolished wall contingent? The existence of the dust, after all, is ultimately linked to human action through a chain of causality. Man pushes wall, wall hits dirt, dirt rises. It's not quite right to say that the rising dust is fascinating because we know it wasn't planned by the filmmaker. I want to suggest that the attraction to the rising dust, as with the wind in the trees, is not a matter of capturing its contingent existence, but a matter of capturing the contingent manner in which it moves. The dust's infinitely various trajectories of fluidic motion are not simply unplanned, as with a stray dog that might spontaneously walk on screen, but are unplannable, seemingly impossible to design, predict, or reproduce. Though the moving images of rising smoke, rustling leaves, and rippling waves don't quite appear to move themselves, as if their movements render them autonomous, animate beings. Their untraceable trajectories were sometimes understood as bestowing a semblance of life, as in Remy de Gourmont's account of the effects of wind and water on vegetation. He says, quote, the wind bent the fir trees on the mountains, the water sprang up at the bottom of the falls, I saw life stirring, unquote. This is a subtle shift, but an important one. Only by reconsidering cinematic incidentals as experiences of unplannable movement, Rather than as experiences of unplanned events, can we open up the discourse of cinematic contingency beyond its historical dependence on photographic media? By considering contingency not only as an ontological property tied to the indexicality of film, but also as an aesthetic experience made possible by the moving images of particular motion forms, I'll explore an unlikely sympathy between the wind and the trees of early cinema and the hyper-realistic details of computer-generated animation such as the flowing hair in Pixar's Brave and the snow in Disney's Frozen. To make my case for this sympathy, I'm going to locate the fascination with contingent motion and a history of aesthetic experience that precedes the moving image, the history of looking at the natural world in motion. If we are to think about why these particular images were appealing, we ought to look at how certain kinds of ungraspable motion posed epistemological and aesthetic problems long before the invention of the, moving image, of the moving image. How, we might ask, do we ground this chaotic motion in the material world of identifiable causes and effects? And secondly, why do we like to look at it? 
Immanuel Kant briefly attempts to bring these two questions together in his critique of judgment. At the end of the analytic of the beautiful, Kant distinguishes between properly beautiful objects and what he calls the beautiful views, characteristic of, quote, the changing shapes of the fire in a fireplace or of a rippling brook, sights which continually arouse the mind by the diversity that strikes the eye, unquote. Kant warns against such sights as mere charms, not beauties. It might seem strange that Kant disqualifies fire and water from judgments of beauty. In Kant's aesthetic system, after all, judgments of beauty are marked by their lack of defining criteria. All objects seemingly have the capacity to be beautiful. The flickering fire and the rippling brook are excluded not because they violate a set of criteria for determining the beauty of objects, but because they defy what Kant takes to be our natural faculty for grasping objects as static, bounded entities. In other words, things need to be stilled and identified as things before we can judge them as beautiful things. Looking at a constantly flickering fire, a rippling brook, or the shifting ribbons of smoke emanating from a cigarette, I'm not sure where the object begins and ends, spatially or temporally speaking. I like the characteristic formlessness of the mathematical sublime, which Kant associates with phenomena so large that they appear boundless with respect to our finite perceptual field, Beautiful views are formless because of their movement. The problem is not that they exceed the spatial limits of our visual field, but that their ceaseless motion confounds our ability to delimit a stable boundary. As explained by Claudia Brodsky, quote, the eye finds itself mentally immobilized by a continuous movement of forms, an unbroken and non-progressive motion which, even while it is being perceived, affords the mind no single point or moment of empirical reference. Instead of overwhelming us with boundless magnitude, this formless movement attracts us. We never tire of looking at objects that stimulate the imagination, stimulate the imagination through continuous formal change. <laughs> this formlessness presents another, even greater problem. A properly beautiful object requires a certain level of identifiable formal rigidity because the feeling of beauty that the object inspires needs to be shareable. For Kant, the feeling of beauty is marked by a claim to universal communicability, that is, a conviction that others ought to find the same object beautiful. Thus, at its very core, aesthetic experience presupposes the existence of an object that could be shared with others. The changing shapes of fire and water, however, make this difficult. According to Kant, given the constant metamorphosis of the object beheld, one cannot imagine that another person could ever behold the same view. It's for this reason that Kant's notion of beautiful views exemplifies what Ray Torada has termed phenomenophilia, a retreat from the perception of the world as given into a sensuous obsession with mere appearance. The most resonant examples of phenomenophilia come from Samuel Taylor Coleridge's interest in optical illusions, hallucinations, and sensory oddities. In Torada's words, contingent perceptions. In his notebooks, for example, Coleridge asks, quote, why do I seek for mountains when in the flattest countries the clouds present so many more romantic and spacious forms, and the coal fire so many more varied and lovely forms? Unquote. Similarly, in his poem Frost at Midnight, Coleridge's speaker moves from contemplating the flames in the fireplace to the fluttering bit of film on the grate. Quote, its motion in this hush of nature gives it dim sympathies with me who live, making it a companionable form. Unquote. In each case, phenomenophilic perceptions do not feel real, and therein lies their appeal. Phenomenophilia denotes perceptual activities that do not fulfill the criteria of shareable experience, thereby replacing the spontaneous community of consesthetics with absolutely private experiences. As a technique of private phenomenal enjoyment, a method of attending to contingency for the sake of aesthetic pleasure, phenomenophilia begs a comparison with cinema. What happens, we might ask, when a thoroughly private perception of Coleridge's fire or Kant's rippling brook is pinned down and pictured, when it's spatially and temporally framed on film? I want to suggest that cinema naturally converts chaotic motion into a singular temporal object by isolating a single point of view and delimiting a frame. Cinema transforms the formless variability into a perfectly repeatable screen event and so allays the problem of Kant's beautiful views by making them aesthetically shareable. 
Thus, early spectators captiv captivated by incidentals are not only marveling at the novelty of movement added to the static photograph, they are also marveling at the capacity for cinematic recording to capture the chaotic world in motion, thereby rendering it a shareable, properly aesthetic object for the first time. The spatio-temporal framing of the world in motion is as much a novelty as the still photograph coming to life. The natural objects most problematic for aesthetic beholding thus become captivating demonstrations of such spatio-temporal inscription. Chaotic motion forms most impressively display the shareability of cinematographic capture as a significant intervention not only in the history of art, but in the history of natural beauty, a history of appreciating the natural world in motion. Primed by their cultural and historical context, early spectators were especially attuned to the verisimilitude of cinema's reproduction of chaotic motion. But in the film culture of today, we are no longer collectively awed by the wind in the trees, even when we can share it with others. As Tom Gunning reminds us, quote, one finds it difficult to be continually astonished by the same thing. Astonishment gives way to familiarity, unquote. I want to suggest, however, that the fascination with the incidentals of moving images, with the chaotic movement of particles of dust, the flickering of flames, the rippling of the surface of water, has persisted into the present day, albeit in a disguised form. Curiously enough, it's in the hyper-controlled realm of computer-generated images that we retain something of the early spectator's fascination with incidentals. Over the last 20 years, commercially produced computer animation has devoted itself to increasingly convincing representations of phenomena notoriously difficult to produce in hand-drawn animation. Chief among these phenomena are the very incidental movements that capture the attention of early spectators, the movements of water and smoke, dust and wind, hair and fabric, phenomena, phenomena that critics and scholars have collectively singled out as particularly mesmerizing and pleasurable to behold. Noting this connection between early cinema and contemporary CGI, Lev Manovich has argued that such phenomena, quote, culturally connote the mastery of mimetic representation. But nowhere does Manovich pause to consider why such phenomena become what he calls privileged signs of realism. To answer such a question, we have to keep in mind the phenomenological insights that link together Kant's aesthetics, the experiences of early cinema spectators, and the challenges faced by computer animators. The convincing rendering of water, dust, and fire has emerged with the advent of what computer animators have called particle systems. Unlike the surface-based system of, po of, polygonal, of polygonal rendering, particle systems describe an animation method that uses the generation and dissipation of points or particles in complex systems of movement. More than simply a technique used to overcome aesthetic problems in the rendering of particular natural phenomena, Particle systems reflect a deep phenomenological attention to those phenomena. Consider this passage from LucasArts animator William T. Reeves. Modeling phenomena such as clouds, smoke, water, and fire has proved difficult with, with the existing techniques of computer image synthesis. These fuzzy objects do not have smooth, well-defined, and shiny surfaces. Instead, their surfaces are irregular, complex, and ill-defined. We are interested in their dynamic and fluid changes in shape and appearance. They are not rigid objects, nor can their motions be described by the simple affine transformations that are common in computer graphics. Within the surface-based system of polygon rendering, <clears throat> movement is understood as the quantitative displacement of a rigid object in three-dimensional space. What Reeves calls fuzzy objects, however, are in constant flux. Their boundaries are inconsistent. In describing the logic necessary to simulate these phenomena, Reeves unwittingly revisits Kant's epistemological crisis posed by beautiful views. Both Kant's aesthetics and polygonal surface rendering rely on the stasis or rigidity of an object's form. Fuzzy objects are difficult to digitally reproduce for the same reasons that Kant claims they trouble our ability to identify them as perceptually shareable. Images of fire, water, and dust, then, have come to culturally connote the mastery of emetic representation, at least partly because of their similar phenomenological problems they pose for both Kant's aesthetics and computer animators. Particle systems solve these problems because the objects they produce are neither static nor volumetrically consistent. Individual particles spontaneously generate and dissolve in real time. Such objects are never concretely formed because stochastic processes are used 
to generate or used to create their shape and appearance. Uh, in other words, the programmer gives each particle a set of parameters, a set of possible movements. But those variations are then randomly determined in real time. Set in motion rather than moved, objects produced by particle systems have the appearance of contingency partly because tiny, each tiny trajectory lies outside the animator's control. It's for this reason that much like the autonomy of the natural world captured in early cinema, particle systems model objects that are, in Reeves' words, alive. We can see the effects of this in a recent video demonstrating the algorithms used to generate snow physics in Disney's Frozen. This is live action, but what follows will be a CGI rendering that tries to imitate it. Uh, neither solely a scientific demonstration uh, nor a spectacular exhibition, the video presents computer-generated snow in various motion tests as aesthetic and scientific investigations of ordinary motion. To focalize our attention and isolate maximum detail, the demonstrations occur in a kind of blank three-dimensional space, colored a neutral black or gray. Even the demonstrations involving characters from the film render those figures gray automatons, thereby shifting our attention from the bodies uh, from their bodies to the physical effects those bodies have on their snowy environments, to the ways that snow particles clump, scatter, stick, and flow. I want to show you some stuff earlier from the demonstration as I talk over it, just to give you a sense of the kinds of simulations they're making. In the words of Frozen's principal software engineer, Andrew Sell, quote, snow is not really a fluid, it's not really a solid, it breaks apart. It can be compressed into snowballs. All of these different effects are very difficult to capture simultaneously." Unquote. Just as the animators become aware of the perceptual otherness of snow when confronted with the task of simulating its category-defining materiality, we feel that very otherness when we witness its lifelike digital representation. The snow's aesthetic appeal is inextricable from our rediscovery of its complexity and our own perceptual capacity to appreciate such complexity. In effect, we're awakened to the impenetrable sovereignty of the viewed world, to the manner in which the world shows itself without regard for human comprehension. Such an awakening is not unique to the estrangement and technological sublimity of the digital era, but is instead an ongoing and renewable capacity of the moving image. By positioning the moving image within a history of looking at the natural world in motion, I've tried to suggest how the digital manufacture of the wind and the trees reincarnates the aesthetic experience of early spectators for a generation inured to the novelty of cinematographic recording. As with the cinema of attractions, we indeed stand in awe of these images as exhibitions of technological novelty and virtuosity. But the fact that we single out the simulations of wind, water, and fire as particularly virtuosic suggests that we've rediscovered the perceptual indeterminacy of their natural reference and the contingency of their movements without being primed by the indexical properties of film. Instead of understanding contingency solely as an ontological property of photographic image making, we also need to understand it as an aesthetic experience activated by the mimetic capacities of all moving images. In other words, the experience of contingency is as much related to what Bazan calls the myth of total cinema, the timeless desire for an increasingly accurate mimicry of the world, as to what he calls the ontology of the photographic image. Whether photographically recorded or digitally manufactured, moving images can point us to the impenetrability of natural phenomena because they equally pin down and picture the contingent movements of the world. Spatially and temporally framed, their verisimilitude becomes an object of aesthetic contemplation, awakening us to the finitude of our perceptual apparatus. In Siegfried Krakauer's words, seeing the movement of leaves captured on film, or we might add, simulated as CGI, impresses upon us the infinity of nature in, quote, an inexhaustible universe whose entirety forever eludes us. Thank you.
run out of time for questions. Um, terrific panel. Uh, and I have a question that I think mainly involves uh, Kristen and Jordan. And um, not to exclude uh, um, Andrew, but uh, first let me address it to Kristen. Um, this, I, I found your presentation of the way 3D works in, in, uh, in uh, Herzog's film very, very convincing and very interesting. The thing I always find utterly unconvincing about the film is this kind of claim that somehow all of these devices are to make moving images. It just seems to me particularly dunderheaded. Uh, but what is kind of curious is the idea that it's kind of implicit in some of what you were saying of the relation between 3D illusions and illusions of motion. I mean, if we think about the actual archaeology of the stereoscope and of uh, then early um, motion devices, I mean, very often stereoscopes actually had the possibility, as I'm sure you're aware, you could close your eye and see one image, open your eye and see the other image, and they would actually create a kind of thaumatrope idea of motion. So I'm curious whether you see a relation between motion and 3D both generally and, and specifically in this film, kind of divorced from the claim that the, uh, the cave paintings are involved. And there's a kind of, to, to maybe clarify the question a little bit, something that struck me, um, Jordan, was the fact that these um, animators talk about this, and, and you quoted it, as living. And of course, what we're seeing is not anything living. I mean, snow is not alive. Uh, and, uh, you know, all of these things are, are actually inanimate in, in, the, in the literal sense. And yet somehow that doesn't sound, it, that doesn't sound dunderheaded to me. I kind of understand what they mean by saying that they feel animated, not just in the technical sense, but, but endowed with a kind of life. So I, I guess I'm trying to get at through the, the, the two questions, kind of a question about almost what the sense of this new technology is in terms of going back to some of the ambitions of moving images of, of, of giving us, you know, a sense of motion in life and whether you see something new here beyond just the kind of realism of, of being able to get a moving image. I, I think I, I definitely agree that, I and mean, I sort of begin by saying that this comment that uh, 3D is meant to, you know, bring into relief those kind of folds and, and sort of um, uh, curves of the cave walls in a way that creates movement. It's not something that I think is very interesting in terms of the use of 3D. I mean, I think if you see the film in 2D, that's, it, it is definitely lost. You, you know, th there is a way that the directionality of the images um, is made clearer when you see how the curves of the wall are being used. Um, but then there's a, also that reference to uh, the, the images where there are eight legs on animals and the, the kind of outline of the rhino um, that is meant to sort of create motion and, and Herzog refers to them as almost proto-cinematic images. Um, and I think that might be the, the route to um, motion rather than, um, you know, sort of focusing just on, on the firelight on the walls or the, uh, the sort of movement um, that maybe can be created or, or the illusion of movement that might result from, from those curves. Um, but I, I actually think that um, the film is really concerned, or, or to me, the, the way what 3D ends up um, emphasizing is the stillness, um, the sculptural, um, the, the kind of uh, the, the lack of movement in this space, and even if um, you know the image that I showed of the of the two scientists, the two kinds of, um, they just sort of stand there for a beat too long, or maybe several beats too long, to the point where they do almost become frozen in time, statuesque, something like um, a contemporary version of the paintings on the cave wall. Um, so, um, so, and I think that's why 
I am just thinking of this in terms of the stereoscope, um, of the home stereoscope, because I, I actually think that the film is, is as much about stillness, or possibly even more, um, and even the uncanniness of, of the stillness and the way that sometimes you get the sense of, you know, the, this hesitation around movement and stillness um, in the way that the, the scientists are filmed, but then also you know, somewhat in those images um, on the wall. But I don't think it's possible, uh, and in fact, I think that's one of the limitations that Herzog is trying to communicate. They're, they can't have fire in the caves. Um, it's impossible to reproduce that without bringing in technology that would destroy the pristine nature of the cave. And so it's precisely that loss of, of motion and movement that I think that 3D actually ends up emphasizing. Um, uh, and kind of replaces it or foregrounds the, the absence of movement with that kind of sculptural solidity. I, I'm not sure if I answered it, but yeah, okay. but there is a kind of media archaeology, um, kind of almost inherent or at least a genealogy in the film. Motion studies would be in there along with moving stereoscopic images, but ultimately, um, I, I think uh, uh, I think the still image and the sculptural and in, in, in media that focus on a kind of lack of movement or an absence of movement. Is as important. Uh, Tom, I take your, the part of your question directed at me to be something like, uh, how do we talk about these terms of of life as being more than or in excess of what we might call verisimilitude or realism, right? That I invoked life, and how do we how do we talk about that? Um, so, the quote that I that brought in from the computer animator uses life. Uh, more, more so in a kind of ontological rather than a phenomenological way, referring to how these things are made. So the idea that there are stochastic algorithms involved in the rendering of computer-generated objects, perhaps better exemplified by, by Massive, the, um, the algorithms used uh, to create crowd scenes where um, where you, you program certain possibilities, but you don't, and, and when you listen to, to these guys talk about what they do, they kind of sometimes wax poetic about the fact that we don't know exactly when that particular uh, automaton will get up and cheer, say, if it's in a you know, gladiatorial scene, or when that, when, when, when he'll sit down and, and kind of be, be stoic, right? Um, this is mirrored similarly in particle systems. It's kind of a reason that I used an animated GIF slide to show you because when you're when you're working with the uh, the programs that that help computer animators render these objects, um, while you're creating them, they're continuously moving. Uh, the algorithms are are in are are set in motion. So it's not. I mean, we have to really think about the what, what computer animators do as very very separate from a slide by slide, frame by frame animation. Uh, they're they're creating these objects with with uh, parameters already built in. They can modify them. And there, there's, there's an, an immense, almost sublime amount of mathematical com complexity to get what they get at. That's what I think the, the frozen uh, demonstration captures. But at the same time, there is a way in which uh, I'm not, ch I'm not uh, rendering each individual movement or those snow par particles. I'm creating an object with physical, uh, with, with algorithms from borrowed from, from physics, from, from a physical understanding of how matter reacts to gravity, right? To, to how matter reacts to the parameters of the world as are understood by science. Those are the things that are kind of implanted into the process of animation, right? So, you know, some people think that restricts what it is we're giving, right? Scott Bukotman in his book on animation, um, the, the, the one prior to the most recent one, um, he, he bemoans the loss of the, of the uh, kind of um, the freedom of kind of Hollywood cartoons, the plasmaticity that Eisenstein liked to talk about so much. He bemoans the loss of that in favor of the slavish adherence to reality, right? Um, but I think one of my favorite little bits from him, he says that, and at the end of it he says, but, but Marina's hair and braid is awesome. <laughs> but he doesn't explain what that means, you know? But I love that he has, it's in, it's in parentheses. He still admits that there's something fascinating about it. Yet he politically he doesn't he doesn't quite like it. Mm -hmm. um, just want to follow up a little bit on that, Jordan. I thought that was a really um, really tremendous paper. 
um, I thought what you, I mean, you said it kind of in passing, but what you said about index Cali was really, I think, excellent intervention in that, with that whole discourse. So, but my question is about the Kant. Actually, I think just Kant is really confused in that passage you just looked at. Um, and he, so this distinction he makes between a beautiful object and a beautiful view, um, I, I don't get that, how a beautiful object, just because it's static, I'm not sure what this, I guess my question for you is, I'm not sure what the role of staticness is playing for you, why that is not, you want movement versus stasis. Because a static object, of course, is only static if you take it in a, in a you know, CGI abstract universe, right? If you've got light falling on a rock, which is static, and you have two people looking at it, they've got two different perspectives on it, and the object looks differently. There's no difference between looking at a rock and looking at a fire, between, share, between questions of shareability. The shareability between two viewers standing in front of a, a, a natural object is going to be, you know, there's, I don't see that there's any issue or problem of shareability there. I don't think it's share, I actually just don't think it's shareable. And then what he's really always talking about is just art objects. Art objects are shareable because they're limited. Um, so when you said it goes to film, right, the, the move from to film is just the difference between natural objects, period, and in artworks, intended objects, right? Intended objects can be shareable, natural objects can't, right? Um, that, I think Hegel, that's Hegel's whole point, right? Kant's just confused about natural objects. Um, so that, I, it just, I, and it's interesting that Kant recognizes that when he's talking about beautiful, that he has this distinction between beautiful views, beautiful objects, as though objects are like artworks, right? Because they're static. Um, but I just, I just don't think that the notion of stasis versus movement is doing as much work here as I think you maybe want it to be doing. Um, I don't think what that's at, what's at stake for you is the movement, uh, because a static object in a film could have as much multiplicity and infiniteness as a moving fire. Just because it's moving, I'm not sure what that, you know, literally moving um, matters so much. Any Anything, any object seen on a screen has that kind of, it seems, infinity. Just because it's moving doesn't, you know, grant it that. I, I really do take your point on being skeptical of the shareability thesis. Um, and I myself might concede that we can, that I might distance myself from, from Kant's position there. And I, and, and present, I'm more, most interested in this passage as, as revealing a phenomenological conviction that Kant has that is a problem for him, right? Um, I'm, it's interesting for me that fire and water presents a problem for its aesthetics. You can have a problem with the very idea of natural beauty being an aesthetic phenomenon, given your interest in, in intention as the uh, as a thing that defines um, the aesthetics of art objects. But I would take issue with the fact, with the claim that there is no difference between a rock and a, and a, and a fire. And these sounds these sounds simple, right? And but I mean, given the perpetual interest of these natural phenomena throughout the history of philosophy, and I'm not just talking about Heraclitus, but I'm talking about uh, Bergson, I'm talking about Deleuze in Cinema 2, where he invokes Bergson and says that there's something about water that kind of uh, reinvigorates my belief in the Bergs Bergsonian claim that the universe is movement uh, itself and not the movement of objects. Now for Deleuze and for Bergson, Fire and, and water and kind of fluidic motion forms like that, they're more than just phenomenologically interesting. They help emblematize process ontology. And I don't care so much about process and, and ontology. I'm not a Deleuzian in that sense. Um, but again, I think their interest in these forms, and take Bachelard, of course, right? The psychoanalysis of fire, his interest in water and air, um, that there's something about the phenomenological experience of these things that helps generate ideas that kind of motivate philosophical concepts. Um, and like I said, I'm less interested in the concepts that they, that they derive. Bachelard's concepts are different from Bergson's, and Bergson's are slightly different from Deleuze's. Um, but I'm more interested in the fact that there is something about the way these things move um, not that they're the same, not that, not that the wind in the trees is the same as smoke, is the same as fire, is the same as water. Um, but I take the shared interest of those phenomena from early spectators as almost confirming that there's something special about these natural phenomena, something special that's different from rocks. Leonardo da Vinci, 
has so many passages on, on looking at water, right? Someone who's really interested in, in straining to describe physical forms, right? Um, so like I said, it's, there's, I, I'm fascinated by the perpetual interest of these, of these kinds of phenomena. Um, it's not to say that rocks are immutable. It's not to say that forms are immutable. But I, I'm, the, I think the reason that it's not quite satisfying, because it's not, my phenomenological reading of these things isn't quite satisfying to me yet. I'm still working on it. I'm going off a conviction that I, that I share and that I identify as a conviction throughout the history of thought and a conviction that I think is evidenced by the claims of early spectators and movie reviewers and Scott Buchotman, who cares about awesome hair. <laughs> one tiny thing. So you, your examples were philosophers talking about these things, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, Bergson is interested in continuity, so he's interested in fire. But if you look at sculptural discourse, right, from artists working in stone, the whole point of it is the changing light, the movement around it, right? It's not static, right? And that's a, it's a it's a complex problem that they're dealing with. Is it being seen in the round? It's a static object, but it's full of a kind of animation. I mean. Oops. There's something too literal-minded, I'm just saying, I, you know, about that. The, the it's, not, it's not the fact of stasis versus movement. There is no such thing as stasis, right? I'm talking about this, the, the relative stasis of form. Now, you can say that, this is, we're really talking about Kant's idea of form, right? Um, and and for, you know, for Bergson, he says there is no such thing as form, right? He takes form as being inherently st static. He's getting that from, I think, the Kantian tradition. Right? So for, for Bergson, the very idea of form is a problem that he wants to get away from, move away from form, get to process. Kant is a kind of thinker for whom stasis matters because form matters. And I think there's something about the formal stasis of these objects, not the fact of their, of their stasis. That's quite different. Nothing is static. Right? Sculptures are, is, sculpture is a medium for which the, the movement, the perceptual movement of the object happens in a kind of in a synchronous uh, relationship with the movement of my body and my eyes, right? But there's something about the fire that has a sense of life. It's not autonomous, but it has a sense of life because it moves in a way that I can't quite predict. It's not the billiard ball, right? When I, shoot, when I hit the billiard ball, I have, a, I have an intuitive sense that I can predict its trajectory. But when I, when I look at the fire, I have a really hard time with that. Uh, Sidney Nagel is a physicist who, have, who has devoted his life to trying to, to, uh, to, to write about the physics of water droplets, right? Like hitting the counter and scattering. These are ordinary phenomena that we don't think about, but for Sidney Nagel, right? So these are scientific as well as aesthetic interests. Does that make sense? Thanks, Marion, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I think I have an answer to that question, but I'm not going to. <laughs> about stasis versus movement, because it seems to me that it's really point of view that's an issue. Um, shareability would be the computization of a single point of view, which is still there in, in you know, film and CGI, et cetera, right? It's, it's, um, so that would make stasis different uh, from movement, in a sense. But anyway, my question is something entirely different, and it's about, um, it's a question about why I mean, I probably I think I know the answer to it, but why are you insisting that um, that there's a continuity between early cinema and CGI? Uh, it seems to me that they are they occupy two completely different historical moments, and that the notion of contingency in each is quite different. You're dealing on the one hand with uh, you could argue a debate of a representation or indexing, if you want to use the word, which I'm sure you don't, but, um, and on the other with uh, simulation, with the simulacra, right? So I think that creating an algorithm that uh, generates contingency is quite different from, you know, uh, early cinema and its relation to contingency. Mm -hmm. um, so you point out what I think is a, the argument in the paper where I talk about the contingency of the particle systems, I don't I almost make an ontological argument to say that there's something similar between the contingency of the natural forms and the simulated, and and the the ontological contingency of the of the stochastic algorithm. It's I flirt with it because it's tempting, but I don't want to make that argument um, because I want to say that there's something about the natural forms themselves 
that, uh, that provokes a similar reaction. Now, you've hinged on something that I'm also kind of wary of, which is the almost ahistorical uh, assumptions in the argument that I'm making. Um, that they are to two totally different um, cultural moments, right? And that I'm not trying to negate the historical and cultural specificity of contingency as a kind of um, world view, as a, uh, or as, a, as a kind of paradigm that really does emerge or reemerges in the 19th century. Um, I don't take issue with that at all. Um, but I kind of feel that the argument I'm making does want to say that there's something about the, that these motion forms are contingent. Right. If, you, if you're talking about the natural forms and the fascination with natural movement, et cetera, um, aren't you positing a uh, kind of transparency to the medium, um, which we heard about this morning? Um, I mean, it, it, we're not looking at the natural forms. No, we're not in looking at the natural forms. Or in, in uh, CGI. I'm trying to reduce what is similar about the moving image as a moving image, um, and, to, and, to, and to talk about what a moving image is as a mediation. So uh, I don't talk about form. I mean, I, I don't talk about um, formal aesthetic choices of filmmakers, right? Which um, James Lastra has a great piece on, on kind of breaking down the idea that contingency and realism of, of early cinema is a, is a medium defined uh, concept, but it's actually an aesthetically defined concept where certain choices filmmakers are making are encouraging us to say that, oh, that was captured in an unplanned way. Um, I think that's a really smart point, right? But I do think that there's a way in which the filming of these natural phenomena uh, it is interesting almost despite the choices that could be made to present them in certain ways. Um, that, you know, we, we look at the uh, Arazura Arose, the, the, the gardener hose, the early Lumiere. Um, and narratologists have understood that as interesting because of its proto narrative gag structure, right? But uh, Tom Gunning points out in an article that uh, there's a lot of talk uh, contemporaneous with that film that didn't talk about, oh, it's, it seems like it's planned in some way, and that seems new, but oh, look at the water coming out of the hose. Right? So the, the early genre of water effects films and wave films was, I think, an acknowledgement that spectators were taking these things out and were really interested in them. Uh, so I don't want to say that formal choice that has nothing to do with the presentation of an unplanned or contingent aesthetic. I don't want to say there's no such thing as a aesthetics of contingency, but I do want to say that there is this other thing, and this other thing we can think about if we think about the natural phenomena themselves and what has made them interesting for philosophers throughout the ages. Um, what, is, what makes them interesting in kind of folk culture, you know, staring at the fire, um, that kind of thing. And I think it, it actually resonates with what Tom was saying in his talk this morning about uh, the precarity of experiencing the world, right? That precarious aesthetics kind of assumes that there's a sense of unmediated experience of the world that has been mediated by blurred images. But there's a sense in which for Kant, when he has a problem with the fire and the water because they make him feel the kind of boundedness of his own perceptual experience of the world, his own understanding of the way things move and his predictability of those movements. I think we're actually up against lunch, but because we're going into lunch, I'm sure that the panelists would be maybe amenable to staying a few minutes and taking some questions independently, so thanks. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I thought it was a fascinating talk this in response to Jordan, and I thought it's interesting that you are, you know, you don't really need to, uh, to talk about uh, this uh, fascination with emotion. And I thought a potential issue with that is that you're really looking at movement as something that's objective, though, right? It's a natural form. Uh, and so I think that's a potential issue. Um, and, and so it's ironic because you're contrasting movement with uh, stasis, but in a way you're putting it into stasis by thinking of movement itself as objective. And um, it's interesting in the sense that when you're uh, talking about the movement of those uh, 
with natural form of, of, this, of the so-called elemental form, right, in Kimbo Bashala, and recently uh, John Peters book of the uh, elemental medium. Uh, and I thought, um, if you put it in the framework of Bergson and Deleuze, what you're talking about is not necessarily uh, not movement image, you're talking about time image. So what you're interested in is motion, but more importantly, duration. Right, so the temporal unfolding is really important for you, especially unfolding in real time. And so I think that would be probably a major dif difference in terms of early cinema versus the digital creation of that. Mm -hmm. so, so what is the temporal dimension there? What is the perception of the time in relation to motion? I think you're, yeah. you're totally right. And I would say that uh, the list of movement image is not about movement. The time image is about movement. Okay. This movement image is about action. And it's about taking movement and imposing a structure of action on movement. But something about duration, temporality, and the kind of elemental motion that I'm getting at, that they're very closely yoked together. And absolutely right, I think there's something about uh, the, the temporality that lacks action. Yeah. That, that uh, temporal, it's the direct image of time that I think is availed by these things. But Deleuze doesn't talk about the wind and the trees, but I wish he would. Uh, because he, he wants to kind of yoke this idea of a Bergsonian time image, a direct image of time, to certain philosophical practices by directors and a certain historical moment in the history of film. But I feel that that he puts a little too much emphasis on on the aesthetic uh, creation of... I mean, I, I, I take Deleuze's point and I like this distinction, um, but the phenomenology of spectatorial experience isn't complete there um, if you don't have early cinema and if you don't think about the, the moving image. But I do think the time image uh, lends a lot of terms that would help me kind of tease out the, the experience. I think duration and temporality are, are absolutely uh, at issue here. I guess Jonathan, and with your permission, could we? Sorry, yeah. yeah. Continue the conversation. Thanks for everyone. Thank you. <laughs>